Thank you uh, very much for that introduction, uh, Manal, and thank you to the Calder Organising Committee and the excellent virology education uh, team for the opportunity to contribute to, to this session. So my presentation will be in three parts. Uh, first, uh, a brief summary of the 2016 WHO Global Hepatitis Strategy and Targets that's provided the roadmap uh, towards elimination. And to summarize what our progress to date has been in meeting those targets with a focus on the hepatitis B EMTCT. Second, to orientate you to the WHO PMTCT guidelines on the use of antiviral prophylaxis that was launched on World Hepatitis Day at the end of July, in terms of the rationale for this new guidance, the new recommendations, and a summary of the evidence base. And thirdly, to discuss briefly some of the feasibility challenges, implementation considerations for implementing these recommendations, and to touch on the opportunities with triple elimination um, and the recent development of elimination criteria at WHO, uh, as well as touching on the impact of COVID. So Maud has already covered this in her excellent uh, presentation um, in terms of the, the epidemiology that we have more than 250 million people currently living with chronic hepatitis B infection with around 900,000 deaths per year with the highest burden and prevalence in the WHO African and Western Pacific region. Worldwide, the most common routes of transmission are the mother to child vertical, as well as the horizontal early childhood transmission that account for most of the chronic infections as summarized by Maud. And therefore, the focus to prevent is, is the most important way to control the hep B epidemic is to prevent these infections, both mother to child and early transmission. Unfortunately, we have a highly effective vaccine. And shown at the top here is the WHO estimates of what the global hepatitis B surface antigen prevalence in children younger than five years was before the widespread in adoption of universal infant vaccination from the 1980s to the early 2000s with a prevalence of 4.7 percent and in 2017 um, uh, down to in fact 1.3 percent. Um, so this is really a great public health success story. Well in 2016 countries endorsed the first ever global health sector strategy for viral hepatitis calling for the elimination of uh, viral hepatitis as a public health threat by 2030, defined as a 90% reduction of new infections among children five years of age for hepatitis B by 2030, and a 65% reduction in deaths, with five core interventions, both prevention as well as testing and treatment. And the red bar highlights the PMTCT interventions with the infant vaccination, um, three doses and also the birth dose and the use of other measures with a target for a 90% coverage for the three dose of the infant vaccination, 90% for the birth dose. This slide shows where we were at as of 2015, which we have established as our baseline, and that's shown in the dark bars, the dark horizontal bars for each of those various service delivery coverage interventions, and the light bar showing what the 2030 targets were. And you can see at a glance that the Hep B vaccination we're really doing well on, much less so on the, uh, the use of birth dose and other uh, PMTCT measures. And then the other striking gap is really the testing coverage and the associated treatment coverage for those who are eligible. But there's good news. Um, there's good news in as much as uh, we are on track to achieve the 2020 target of the 90% coverage with the third dose of the Hep B vaccine. 
Um, and as of 2018, coverage of the three dose of the vaccine reached 84% worldwide, compared to around 30% in 2000. But the coverage of the birth dose remains much lower and uneven. So for example, the coverage of the birth dose is 42% globally, but only 4% in the African region. Um, so still many challenges ahead. But as a result of these decades of progressive scale up of the third dose of the heavy infant vaccination, we are now, we have now achieved the 2020 global target of less than 1% hep B surface antigen prevalence in five-year-olds. And this was based on a systematic review and modeling work undertaken by John Edmonds and his team at the London School. And you can see here by region, um, the prevalence rates and overall a 0.84%, uh, 9.4% prevalence um, uh, uh, among five-year-olds and all regions achieving less than 1% other than the Afro region, which is still at 2.53%. So I've highlighted uh, progress and some of the successes. Uh, in addition to the reduction in prevalence in five-year-olds, there's also been a substantial reduction in the drugs and diagnostics. Tenofovir is generally available for $25 to $30 per year. It's, uh, uh, there's no longer any patent in any country and generics are widely available. And there has finally now started to be a reduction in the molecular, uh, uh, the viral load test, both for hepatitis C and hepatitis B, with costs now reducing uh, in, in many areas to less than $15. Um, still, we have some way to go with hepatitis B. There's been more progress with hepatitis C. And although 5 million, more than 5 million as of 2018, were uh, receiving hep B treatment, um, this is still falls uh, far short of uh, um, uh, given that we have 257 or so uh, people living with chronic hepatitis B infection and many remain undiagnosed. So there has been evolving WHO guidance. Uh, we've, uh, it's already been mentioned about the WHO uh, recommendations for uh, that all infants should receive a first dose of hep B vaccine as soon as possible after birth, preferably within 24 hours, followed by two to three doses to complete the primary series. And in 2015, in the hep B guidance, there was recommendations for who to treat that the use of tenofovir in those with cirrhosis or in the absence of cirrhosis, those with a raised hep B DNA greater than 20,000 and raised liver enzymes. On that occasion, we did not make a recommendation for use of antivirals um, in 2015. And this was largely because of at that time, the limited and low quality evidence base with still several ongoing uh, clinical trials that were due to report the limited comparison for different antivirals. There was only one observational study for data with uh, tenofovir and a lack of consensus as to the programmatic implications of a policy of more widespread antiviral use in pregnancy with limited access to viral load. Following those guide guidelines, also there was the testing guidelines on viral hepatitis, as well as the consolidated guidelines on hep HIV testing, recommending that all pregnant women should be tested for HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B at least once and as early as possible. So the main reasons for these new WHO guidelines on the use of antivirals was because of the new evidence now emerging for trials, that there were now increasing requests from regions and countries in the context of plans for triple elimination of HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B for mother-to-child transmission. And also concerns that timely birth dose uh, alone, together with the infant vaccination schedule, may not be sufficient to reach the elimination goals of 0.1% prevalence in children under the age of five. Um, 
And so the vision and the hierarchy of interventions, just to uh, so that uh, the new recommendations can be po positioned within this hierarchy, is that clearly scaling up access to a timely birth dose is the most important and cost effective option for preventing infection. Um, but in those countries in particular that have already achieved high vaccine coverage, um, and so a reduction in horizontal transmission, mother to child transmission accounts for a high proportion. And in these settings, routine testing among pregnant women and offering tenofovir prophylaxis for those that are eligible is really an important additional opportunity together with HBIG as well in those settings. So the new WHO guidelines have two key recommendations. First, in addition to the series of hep B vaccination, that's the first dose within 24 hours, as well as the two to three additional doses, WHO now recommends that pregnant women testing who are hep B surface antigen positive with a hepatitis B DNA equal or greater than 200,000 international units per mil receive tenofovir prophylaxis from the 28th week of pregnancy until at least birth. And that was a conditional recommendation based on moderate quality of evidence. Secondly, in settings where hepatitis B DNA testing is not available at antenatal sites, WHO also recommended the use of hep B E antigen as an alternative test to determine eligibility for prophylaxis to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Um, and thirdly, that, uh, that it would also be important uh, uh, as a rider that all the pregnant women should first be assessed for eligibility for long-term antiviral treatment based on their own health needs before initiation of, uh, of prophylaxis as addressed in the 2015 guidelines. And this is a uh, simplified algorithm that catches the assessment of the pregnant woman, both for uh, whose hep B surface antigen positive, both for her own health needs in terms of eligibility for long-term prophylaxis, or whether, um, and this is uh, in the, the pink box, uh, whether she fulfills the criteria for starting antiviral prophylaxis with, of course, reassessment subsequently as to whether long-term treatment may be necessary. And this is all on the foundation of the hep B birth dose vaccination, infant vaccination, and the use of HBIG if available. So what is the evidence to support these uh, recommendations? Uh, well, the Evidence base was from systematic reviews, impact and cost effectiveness modeling, an overall assessment of the benefits and harms and, and the balance of the benefits and harms at both an individual and population level, and patient and health worker values and preferences, as well as resource use. So this slide summarizes the systematic review undertaken by Yasuki Shimakawa and his team at the Institut Pasteur. Uh, and this was uh, an evaluation of the efficacy and safety of peripartum antiviral prophylaxis. Um, there were around 129 studies, 33 randomized trials. Um, based on 18,000 uh, women. And of note, there were only seven studies outside China. So the vast majority were in China. And none of the studies evaluated the efficacy of antivirals without HBIG. So in other words, with birth dose alone. Um, and this slide shows uh, well the um, um, impressive uh, result demonstrating the substantial protective effect with a uh, odds ratio of, of around 0.17. Uh, the second systematic review was addressing the question of identifying the viral load threshold in HB infected pregnant women um, above which the risk of immunoprophylaxis failure increases. And this shows uh, it's slightly off center here based on 66 studies. Um, showing that the risk of transmission um, increases um, uh, uh, above 
200,000 IU per, per mil. And finally, addressing the question of the alternate use of the E antigen to identify those um, with a high viral load based on a hepatitis B DNA, as well as address the question of how well the E antigen test predicts immunoprophylaxis failure. Um, and the conclusion uh, was uh, uh, to the, the first question that the overall pool sensitivity for um, uh, 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 diagnosing a high viral load was 88% and specificity uh, 93%. And overall, the E antigen has a high sensitivity but low, lower specificity for predicting the risk of mother to child transmission. And I, as has been highlighted already by Maud, now turning to the modeling away from the systematic reviews that really the evidence showed and Maud showed a magnified version of this, that birth dose scale up really has the largest incremental impact on the new chronic infections, taking it down to this lower bar. But the final lower bar is the use of antiviral prophylaxis with screening in pregnant women. And in terms of the, uh, the issue of feasibility and patient and health worker response, we undertook an online consultation as part of the guidelines process, 153 healthcare workers, 56 program managers and 81 civil society representatives. And around three quarters felt it was feasible to provide testing and offer tenofovir prophylaxis to eligible pregnant women. But the challenges highlighted were those of the high cost and availability of HPV viral load, the inadequate training of healthcare workers, limited knowledge about HIV among those living with hepatitis B infection, and lack of capacity and infrastructure. So clearly these are issues that need to be addressed to ensure full implementation. So in terms of implementation, um, how feasible will it be to implement these recommendations? Well, I think there is reassurance, certainly from the experience for the elimination of mother to, to child transmission of HIV and syphilis, that providing testing for pregnant women followed by antiviral prophylaxis for those with HIV is feasible. And as of the end of 2018, about 80% of pregnant women globally knew their HIV status and 82% of those tested positive for HIV received treatment. But the same is of course not yet true for syphilis or hepatitis B. And clearly different geographic regions are faced with different scenarios with respect to the prevalence of hepatitis B, service coverage of immunization, including birth dose, the availability of commodities, particularly diagnostics, as well as antivirals. And so the implementation of the recommendations um, will vary by region. So in high endemicity regions, such as the African region, where there is currently suboptimal coverage of infant hep B vaccination, really the priority is, of course, increasing coverage of timely birth dose to achieve the greatest impact. Whereas in low endemicity countries with already high coverage of infant vaccination and birth dose or targeted birth dose, peripartum tenofovir prophylaxis in those high risk populations with high hep B DNA would prevent further perinatal transmission. And I think an important uh, uh, consideration going forward will be access to hepatitis B DNA and the existing infrastructure that is already available, be it high throughput or point of care uh, platforms such as GeneXpert. And a really important opportunity um, going forward is the opportunity to advance the HEP B EMTCT agenda as part of triple elimination. Um, so triple elimination, an initiative that promotes the elimination of mother to child transmission of three infections that have some common routes of transmission, um, common approaches to, to testing and service delivery in an antenatal setting, um, and are highly prevalent in low and middle income countries. Um, and really advancing the agenda to provide integrated patient-centered care within the context of antenatal. 
And of course, many regions, or at least three regions um, within the WHO uh, geographic regions, had already been pursuing um, the dual elimination of HIV and syphilis, and there was already momentum for the addition of Hep B EMTCT. And so two regions in particular uh, started 2016 and 17, that's the region of the Americas and also the Western Pacific region and now the Syro region as well, have triple elimination plans and a framework for elimination. And we have also now been actively moving ahead with the development of validation criteria for the elimination of viral hepatitis and held our first meeting at the end of June focusing on Hep B EMTCT and have moved forward with some early um, uh, uh, steps with um, development of impact criteria, as well as the program service delivery criteria, and with the vision to develop something similar to the HIV syphilis uh, path to elimination for those countries that are still some way off reaching elimination with a gold, silver and bronze uh, category uh, in order to motivate and incentivize countries to progress on the path to elimination. I think we will be returning this in, in the discussion and Maud has already alluded to this of really addressing um, what measures are needed to improve uh, hepatitis B uh, coverage. And of course, the impact of COVID on all this with staff repurposed, MCH services impacted both provision of services, uptake of services, as well as access to HIV, hepatitis and STI services for testing and ongoing treatment. And some modeling work um, uh, from Imperial College uh, uh, for World Hepatitis Day um, demonstrated um, uh, well the, the impact of uh, if vaccination scale up is, is disrupted in 2020, such that coverage drops by 20% for infant and 60% for birth dose, this could result in an additional 630,000 um, chronic in, uh, in infections um, and 130,000 um, HPV related deaths among children born in 2020. So these are initial models demonstrating the um, uh, impact of disruption in services. And this is a major focus at WHO, is really ensuring uh, re-establishing and maintaining essential health services. So final slide uh, that should be the acknowledgements. I'd just like to acknowledge the many people that contributed to, to these guidelines and to the evidence generation. And just to flag uh, from some of the slides I showed, uh, Judith Van Holten, who undertook the values and preferences, Morgan Newman leading on the HIV uh, uh, PMCT, and Shalini Desai from WHO on the immunization, and Yasuki uh, Shimakawa for the systematic review, and Shivanti uh, Nayagam and Tim Hallett for the modeling. Thank you very much.